Hello and happy Tuesday. Welcome to our June procurement talk. I can't believe it is already summertime. Beautiful warm weather here in Danville. I think it's supposed to be in the in the 70s today. Wanted to do a big warm welcome to everyone that's joined us from all over the globe. This is an event series we started with our sponsors a couple years ago. And the goal was to collaborate and connect and bring the procurement community together to share ideas and to network. We used to do these in person. And then once COVID hit, we decided we wanted to, to keep it going. And so now we host these every month virtually. And these would not be possible without our four fabulous sponsors that make this event series um, at no cost to anyone who's in the procurement space. So I wanna thank each of our sponsors and give them an opportunity to talk a little bit about their companies and some of the cool and unique things that they're working on. So Eric, with that, I'm going to have you uh, kick off the intros and love the cool blue background. Thanks. Yeah, it looked like a little bit of a cartoon, but um, yeah, thanks a lot, Sarah. And it's a it's a hot day here in the Northeast in the New York area, so it's about 90, but I'll take it because we've been wanting this uh, all year long, so it feels good to have summer here. But thanks to um, the panelists and everyone joining today, and Rapid Ratings is proud to be a sponsor of the 2021 Monthly Procurement Talks. So appreciate everyone joining. And we're a SaaS-based algorithmic system enabling financial health transparency and predictive insights between procurement or supply chain risk managers and their suppliers. And we're really transforming the way teams manage enterprise and financial risk on both public and private companies. And what we do that's unique is that we are gathering financials, primary sourcing them from private companies. And, you know, we've been really busy over the last year with the pandemic, you know, keeping busy, it always takes a crisis, but um, really helping our clients mitigate risk early on and doing stress testing in different scenarios, you know, given the industries that have really, you know, gone down and of course are now trying to bounce back. So enjoy awesome. today. Thanks, well, Eric. Thanks so much for uh, being with us and hopefully I'll be able to see you in person I know. soon when I get back to New York. Definitely. All right, next up we have Gabby from Jagger. Gabby, thank you so much for being with us today and for being a sponsor. We'd love to hear a little bit about your company and some of the cool things you guys are doing. Uh, thank you so much for having us as a sponsor, Sarah, and to all the other sponsors and everyone. We're really excited to be a part of it. Um, for those who are not familiar with Jagger, we are a procurement platform um, full end-to-end -end, uh, supplier to procurement suite uh, through contracts and everything. Um, but I'd say the most exciting thing that we're doing right now is actually running, um, we've dubbed it our first annual autonomous procurement month for June. We're running a series of webinars this month um, on some of those newer technologies that maybe people aren't as comfortable with, aren't ready to implement in their organizations, um, like RPA, using AI, using augmented analytics. Um, so we're running these every Thursday and we've gotten a great reception so far for the first one. Um, and, you know, we're just trying to get as much thought leadership out there about it right now. So that's our, that's our big exciting initiative at the moment. Awesome, Gabby. And I know you guys are putting out some really good content about AI. So I've been enjoying reading the articles and following along. So thank you for being with us. Oh, thanks. Ken, you are up next. Um, enjoying the, the beautiful SoCal weather. It looks like it's nice and sunny there today. Uh, it's great. It's been perfect 80 degrees, just comfortable weather to, to sit outside, listen to some music, maybe have a cocktail or two. Um, just a really, really nice time right now in Southern California before it gets warm um, uh, up to the hundreds. But um, yeah, it's great. And Sarah, I'm super excited to see you Saturday. So so that's going to be awesome. I get to go on an airplane. I get to see humans. Uh, I'm not, I graduate this week uh, where I'm no longer a second grade teacher because she's done with school, my, my eight-year-old. So life is moving on. So that's great. So <laughs> we're going to get back to it. Um, uh, so I'm Ken Bomerick here, uh, Vice President of Business Development at Worldwide Services. And what we do, we're, we're, we're on the hardware side of the telecom industry, where we buy, sell, and maintain pre-owned 
um, IT solutions equipment, anything from Alcatel Lucent to Cisco to Juniper to, to I say zones, right? The A through Z. So we touch on all those ones to, to extend the life of your network in, in many different fashions, many different services. One of the things we've done over the last couple of years is partner with some, some companies to make our solution enhanced, if you will. We can do the hardware and, the, and that part of it, but, but now that the world is moving and there's cybersecurity and all the, the crazy things that's going out there, people wanna know what they have, where they have, where the gaps are and what they're doing. And that right there is the intelligent network automation so solution, right? So we've partnered with a company, Sarah, you're gonna to get to meet them the, this weekend. And he brings the intelligent side of what we do. He shows you the problem and, and, and where you need to, to, to fill it. And we come in and do the hardware work of it. So could be a fun partnership. Hopefully we get to talk to some of you guys and, and, and learn more about this together. So hopefully that helps. Awesome, Ken, excited for Saturday. So looking forward to seeing you in person after almost two years. I know, crazy, huh? <laughs> All right, Manish, wonderful to have you with us today. Happy Tuesday. We'd love to hear a little bit about your company and some of the cool things you guys are working on. Absolutely, thank you, Sarah. Uh, first of all, thank you to all the panelists for donating your time and sharing your experience, not just with the sponsors, but also with the audience. Uh, my name is Manish Senta. I'm Managing Director for TechWisen Group. Um, I'm based in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, so if anybody is Go Blue, hey, Go Blue. Um, our company mostly focuses on two line of business. One is statement of work on five IT skill sets and other is talent acquisition in those skill sets. We have been supporting clients currently in seven countries. So US, UK, Canada, Australia, India, and Netherlands. Um, and my way of participating in these group is just to learn a procurement mindset, what drives a certain discussion, what triggers the pain point, how does it really work with different internal business unit. So when I jump on these calls, I'm, I'm constantly making notes to learn from your experience. So when I have to deal with the procurement, I can use some of those experience to make the relationship easier and seamless. Awesome, Manish. Well, excited to have you with us and looking forward to hopefully seeing you and your brother in the fall at, at some of the conferences. Alrighty, so a couple housekeeping notes and then we are going to kick off our panel discussion today. We've got a fabulous group of procurement leaders from all over the US doing some really cool, unique things at their companies. So at the bottom, you'll see the chat function. Do not be shy. Feel free to put your notes and comments and we'll be engaging and interacting throughout. We also have a Q&A function. If you have a question you would like to ask to a specific panelist or a general question that you'd like Heather to ask everyone, feel free to put that in the Q&A and we'll make sure that those are addressed. So with that, uh, we are, I wanna introduce our panel moderator for today. We have Heather Foch, the toner queen, and she is rocking her fabulous crown, which is my uh, the highlight of her wardrobe. So, so happy she was, um, she decided to uh, bless us with her crown today. She is the toner queen. So anything toner related uh, that you need in procurement, she is your go-to gal for that. A couple fun facts about Heather before I turn over the discussion to her. She worked for two years while in college for her biology professor, helping her genetics lab um, running quarterly classes for students. So you can ask her anything about fruit flies. So Heather, we may have to get a, a fun fact from you about that. Her secret passion is to become a professional chef but she does note she does not bake. And third, she volunteers for the National Italian Greyhound Rescue Foundation and dogs are her kids and she's um, been adopting dogs for many, many years. So with that, Heather, super excited to have you with us today and I'm gonna kick it off um, the panel and turn it over to you so you can um, ask our panelists all the questions that we have prepared today. 
Thank you very much, Sarah. First off, I have to say just how humbled I am to be a part of your, your monthly P Talks this summer uh, for Up in the Annie. Um, I've had the opportunity to have quick little chats with um, all of our panelists over the last week or so, and I'm super excited to hear them open up about how they've been able to maximize their procurement value within their organizations. Um, what the pandemic has really taught them um, and what direction they see procurement heading going into the future. So super excited about all of that. Um, as Sarah mentioned, my name is Heather Foch. I'm the founder and toner queen at Quality Imaging Solutions. My company focuses on not just spend reduction on printer toner cartridge supplies, but we take that one step further and focus on more of a strategic approach on what printer hardware are, is being acquired uh, by an organization so that we can help our procurement clients drive savings even deeper for the consumables that their units are using. Um, so it's very fun. I've been doing this about 20 years and I absolutely love it. Um, I've come across a, a lot of great people. Um, but uh, with all that said, I would love to kick this off by having our panelists do a quick round of self-introductions beginning with Carla. Um, so Carla, so if you can introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your background and if you could vacation anywhere right now, where would that be and why? Hi, my name is Carla De Castro. I'm a technology sourcing lead at Dropbox. I have been in procurement and sourcing for over 15 years. I don't say 20 because it's going to age me. And most of them will be in technology sourcing, specifically in the Bay Area. I also work in Texas. Uh, that's why you can see some accent here. Here is some accent. Um, I, I have been in different industries uh, and um, mostly uh, developing uh, teams and uh, leading uh, in organizations uh, related to uh, technology and um, you know services. So if I would go and I travel a lot, I love to travel. This is one of my hobbies. So I think I would go. Maybe I would go back to Greece. You know, I haven't thought too much about that, but it's one of the places that I really love. You know, I did some cruising there, like sailing. And so I would probably just uh, take a sailboat and sail for like one week. It's kind of safe, you know, after COVID. So I think it's a good plan. That's wonderful. You know, I've got some friends that um, are, are every summer they rent they go home they're, they're from from europe eastern europe and every summer they start in greece and rent a boat to sail for a full month and they just go around the whole thing and i'm like can i be like can you tuck me inside your suitcase and just bring me with you i would really just love that because it's so beautiful there that's awesome thank yeah. you um alan how about you yeah so thanks for uh for having me it's great to be here today uh, my name is Alan Byrne. I'm the Director of Indirect Procurement for Lagrand North and Central America. We're part of a global company headquartered in Limoges, France, and we make products in the lighting, power, and data infrastructure uh, industries. Uh, I've been in procurement for many years. I started on the direct side working for Stanley Black & Decker. I moved over to indirect and spent a lot of time with uh, Aetna Healthcare, which you've probably heard of. I was there about six years. Um, I've had a lot of focus on M&A activity and capturing supplier synergies, transforming organizations. And uh, I'm currently focusing on indirect uh, here at Lagrand. Wonderful. And where would you vacation if you could go anywhere right Oh, now? geez. You know, I've, I thought about this. Maybe, maybe the beach movie the beach was filmed that that would be a pretty cool place to go i think it's in thailand maybe oh yeah just without the sharks though right <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah i'm a beach person so anything along the ocean would be a, a great thing for me wonderful wonderful um susan how about yourself sorry about that getting that mute button is it takes a few seconds but yeah, same. Thank you uh, to Sarah, RSN, the sponsors, Heather. It's you know great to be a panelist and thank you for the invite. So yeah, just about myself, I've been in the supply chain industry for the past 20 years. Um, I've always been on the food service side. So I've always worked for various restaurant brands, um, spent 12 years with the company ARCOP, which is the supply chain cooperative for Arby's. Um, then I took a little crazy move and moved out to Las Vegas where I worked for Caesars Entertainment. 
Um, then an emerging brand called Capriati Sandwich Shop, um, and then came back to the East where I worked for Honey Baked Ham, and uh, then spent some time with other restaurants, including McAllister's Deli, Moe's, Southwest Grill, Schlotzky's. Um, and my current role, which I just started two months ago, is with Bloomin' Brands, and we have Outback, Fleming's, Carrabba's, and Bonefish Grill. So most of my career has always been about 18 of those years was had packaging at some point. So I was always involved on the disposable side. Um, but right now with my current role, it's all food. So I do desserts, seasonings, appetizers, and sides. So um, excited to be here. And again, thank you for the opportunity. And um, for myself, um, Greece is definitely on my list. I've never been, so it's definitely, but some of the places I wanna go that just here in the US that I've never been, um, but Wyoming, every all this the show that came out Yellowstone, which I don't even know if it's filmed there. But um, I would love to go to Yellowstone and see the Grand Tetons. And um, you know, I read that Wyoming is like the tenth largest state, but the least one of the least populous. So kind of sounds nice being an area not so populated. So that would probably be on my list. Absolutely, I had an opportunity a few years ago to stay in Jackson Hole mm. for a week, and it was the most beautiful scenery I think I'd ever seen in my whole life. It was so pretty. Well, and to coincide with Alan, I'm currently based in Atlanta, but actually will be relocating with my new job to uh, the Tampa St. Pete area. So I am heading for beach life and I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Ashish, how about how about we have you uh, in doubt the, uh, the self introductions and, and please do let me know where you would vacation unless it's the Netherlands. <laughs> Yeah, that could be one of the place. Uh, uh, thank you, Heather. Uh, thank you, sponsors. Thanks, Sarah, for having me here. Super excited. Uh, hello, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well. Uh, I am Ashish Gupta. I am based out of Dublin Bay Area, even though I feel these days uh, your physical address doesn't matter. What matters is your IP address. Uh, I lead marketing and sales uh, strategic sourcing at Florex. Uh, I have been associated with Clorox for many years, uh, initially as a consumer, but last two and a half years as a proud employee. Uh, last year, uh, there was a you know, poll done, Harris Poll Essentials 100, where Clorox was named uh, number two in the most essential company in US during COVID and number one in integrity. And uh, I know like Clorox wipes was a buzzword uh, last year, uh, but we, uh, Clorex market, some of the most trusted uh, and recognized consumer brands in you know, uh, cleaning, uh, uh, personal care, water filtration, uh, you know, vitamins, minerals, supplements. Uh, my background, I have a diverse background as I've worked in software development, uh, program management, uh, business operations, and various procurement categories across the globe. Uh, if I think of my procurement uh, background storyline, uh, I think it'll be from a washing machine to a self-driving car, uh, which is a procurement journey from cleaning to collaboration. Uh, on personal front, I'm a yoga practitioner and which has helped me immensely during the pandemic. Uh, and I love watching Netflix series and movies, uh, but these days I am on a movie fasting because my wife says you can watch any movie anywhere, any number of times. So it's like a forced fasting for me. Uh, on vacation, I think there are two places. One is, you know, of course, I want to go back uh, to India to meet my family. I want to hug my niece, my mom. Uh, the other vacation is um, I want to recycle myself as a kid and uh, go to Disneyland and visit fairy tale and experience the magic there. So, you know, we probably all could use a little bit of that in our life right now. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, you know, everybody, I'm so excited about, um, you know, today in general and all the great questions that we've got for everybody. And I'm, I'm very excited to hear about everyone's insights regarding procurement and value. Um, so, Carla, if you don't mind me starting with you. Um, can you describe how your team is adding value um, to your organization as it relates to technology sourcing and how has that aligned with your company's goals? Sure. Uh, we have implemented a program across the organization that aligns uh, with company goals and reducing operational expenses uh, and increasing cash flow. So this program focuses on software spend 
And besides generating savings, uh, has a goal to further mature the software purchasing governance and risk reduction. So we are starting uh, the software renewals earlier and looking at opportunities to deprecate licenses, especially the ones that are redundant to, this, to the environment. Uh, we are paying attention to active users and its utilization. So a cross-functional team is validating the solution prior to renewal. Uh, this so far uh, has saved uh, uh, over $2 million in two quarters, and we are planning on double that for the year. Um, what is different uh, from last year's program that we had and this year, we have broadened our scope to address software across the company. So we have developed a steering committee that includes representation from IT, legal, finance, and more specifically, IT asset management, architecture teams, security and data privacy. This creates an, uh, an accountability uh, and aligns everyone with the same goal. So on the service side, we, we have developed a self-serve approach uh, where we implemented the artificial intelligence tool uh, called Globality uh, to help with RFPs and benchmarking. So the tool uses uh, AI to help build requirements and invite service providers to bid on specific scope. Also helps with our supplier diversity uh, initiative because uh, it, it does select diverse suppliers with the events. So this result um, resulted in increased number of RFPs that we are running at any given time. And sourcing is always engaged to run. So that helps with compliance as well. Uh, we will be advising on the projects or we will be having a more active approach. But uh, the self-serve really helps us to expedite process on uh, everybody you know, um, um, reviewing their services uh, in a way that it's in compliance with procurement, with, with what we, we think procurement should be doing, right? So um, uh, we, we also, I think the important part of this, you know, if everybody's running this, uh, um, the bids in, in, uh, in this tool, we are ensuring a competitive price uh, when we are procuring services. So those are some of the initiatives that we have been um, doing this year. That's wonderful. And I love hearing about um, the amount of stakeholder engagement and alignment you guys have been able to bring to the table too, because it's so important to have everyone you know, on the same page and sitting at the same table um, to be able to accomplish your goals. Sure. That's wonderful. Um, Alan, so I'd like to, to start with you next, um, if possible. Um, can you tell me um, a little bit more about how technology has become a bigger focus as companies um, work to accommodate telework among its employees and, and changing needs that are happening within the organization? Yeah, sure. Um, we are a company that's been highly acquisitive and I've been here six years. We've acquired a dozen companies and uh, it takes time to integrate those companies into our infrastructure. And within the period uh, before those companies are, are actually technically integrated, we sometimes find that their cybersecurity posture isn't uh, strong to, to an extent that we would like it to be. Um, we did have some circumstances unfold here within our company in 2020 that put us uh, on a high uh, level of sensitivity and uh, actually uh, we needed to identify a, an external security operations uh, provider to, to help us and it was new it was a new it was new to us as a company we, we, we really didn't have an acumen or, uh, or or a strong expertise in that area internally and it was new to me obviously being a procurement person I'm involved in just about anything and everything and uh you're, you know, we're always uh, getting thrown into uncomfortable positions where we may not be resident experts in what we're dealing with. But um, in, in the scenario there, I was really, really uh, pleased to learn that the CEO and the CIO, um, you know, personally made it a point to make sure that our procurement team, personally, me and my team, played a leadership role in finding the right partner to provide those services. And to me, it was the ultimate pat on the back to just really... Uh, 
you know, feel as though they were getting, you know, the value that procurement can offer and they see it. And in one of the most, you know, that biggest priorities of the company within 2020, you know, we were tasked with playing a leadership role in, in making those services, uh, you know, be, be enabled and put in place. So I was proud of that as an example of how, uh, how I played uh, that role last year. That's wonderful. Um, and just to, to know that you were heard, you know, by the other executives that were there um, and, and having that seat at the table really goes to show um, maybe how C-suites are, are now more open to what value, you know, procurement brings to the table um, as far as all the different um, aspects that you guys all do, which is, which is awesome. Um, so thank you for sharing that example. Um, Susan, uh, can you tell me a little bit about a project where you maximized procurement value for your company? Absolutely. So um, during my last tenure with a company, we had seven restaurant brands. And one of the things we noticed um, was, and unfortunately, we fast casual QSR, we use a lot of plastic cutlery. And so across the seven brands, um, I did started doing an evaluation and, re, and looking at that category and realized we had over 40 SKUs with everything from plastic to polystyrene, medium weight, heavy weight, Orange, orange spoons, black spoons, white spoons. I mean, we had so many different SKUs across all of our brands. And so started a project and basically um, worked um, on bringing the value of narrowing it down to four pieces of cutlery. You have a spoon, a fork, a knife, and a soup spoon. That's all we need. Um, but, you know, in order to bring that value, you know, we had to show that we had a, one of the brands it used to use an orange spoon and they swear that they had to have an orange spoon for their products. And, you know, we had to go like very high up. We had to get a lot of layers to approve. Um, but, you know, we brought the value by showing, by reducing the SKU count, by getting a cost savings because we were being more efficient with production. You know, we had to show all of these reasons why that value made sense for all of the seven brands to purchase these four pieces of cutlery. Um, but it, there was a couple, like I said, brands that were holding out and we really had to continue showing why that brought value to them. And again, you know, because it reduces the, um, the amount of bit, the number of SKUs, we're getting a lot of pressure from our distribution centers um, for the amount of SKUs that we have that are proprietary. Um, but we did, we were able to finally get everyone to agree to go to a black heavyweight um, and they all agreed. So it was a cost savings. It reduced SKU count by 30 SKUs plus. Um, so there was a lot of wins with that project, um, but it, it was like a moving a mountain. I mean, it took probably, I would say over a year to get that project finalized. Um, so there was some frustration along the line, but I think once we showed the value, once we were able to show all the brands that everyone moving in the same direction was a win for everybody across the board. That's awesome. You know, there definitely is something to be said about the end user acceptance factor <laughs> and, and how happy, you know, everyone is with, with the supplies and, and products that they use every day. Um, I recently had a experience with a local food delivery service where when I placed my order before I got to check out, they asked me a question. Do you want the disposable silverware? Oh, nice. Good. It was, yeah. yeah. Because, because honestly, if I'm at home, I'm not, I'm, I will eat with a normal fork or spoon or whatever. I'm not exactly. using the plastic one that they sent me. So it just, ends up in, it just ends up in the garbage. So that's, that's, you know, pennies, but you times that times however many of those you send out, that's a few yep. savings too. Well, and we also had to ask the, the brand itself. It's like, show me the data, show me where a consumer is not going to come to your brand because you don't give them an orange spoon. Right. I bet you it doesn't exist. No, <laughs> exactly. So we kind of won our agreement and we were able to move forward. So it was, we felt it was a win across the board. That is a huge win. And you know what people think sometimes, um, you know, what the savings on spoons on, so on plastic silverware is probably, you know, fractions of pennies, you know, at the purchase price. But when you times that by it was, it was about a $500,000 savings overall yeah. when it was across all the seven brands. So we, we felt it was a, I think it's always a $2 million contract. I can't remember offhand, but, but we felt it was a really good win. So oh, yeah. total no brainer. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, Ashish, I would like to round out this first round of uh, questions with you if I could. Um, so can you tell me more about 
the levers that you um, use for value creation through suppliers that you and your team have had, have had success with so far? Thank you, Heather, for this question. Uh, when we talk about levers, you know, value creation through suppliers, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is how do we leverage, you know, supplier enabled uh, innovation, um, you know, because suppliers have a diverse, uh, you know, customer base, uh, they have access to market, uh, they have greater capacity for innovation, uh, and how do you leverage their skills, you know, capabilities. Uh, and I think the, you know, the initial questions to ask is when uh, somebody says, hey, you know, can we leverage suppliers innovation is are we ourselves, you know, innovative uh, to maximize value through suppliers innovation. I mean, do we track or encourage our suppliers, uh, you know, to to uh, to innovate? Uh, uh, you know, I, I remember a story, and I think it might relate to some of you. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, I learned to color within a box, and I got rewarded every time when I colored within a box. But when I grew up following the same pattern, uh, you know, I got feedback that I'm not thinking out of the box. And I think we follow the same with our suppliers. Initially, we ask them to work within a certain boundary. Uh, and then very soon we start complaining, hey, you are not innovating. Um, so uh, we, we need to break that mindset. It's a change in the mindset itself. It's about exploring. It's about you know, creating channels uh, you know, to challenge each other, uh, you know, to discuss more than you know, the cost and the current scope of services. Uh, it's about building trust. And I always say, you know, trust is something which is very high in demand, but very low in supply today. Uh, so you ask suppliers, can that, can that supplier be a supplier of that trust? Uh, and uh, so some of the things which what we have done is when we are establishing a new relationship, uh, as procurement, we are investing time with our suppliers. And by the way, in marketing, uh, we don't call suppliers, we mostly call agencies and partners. Uh, you know, aligning with our expectations and not just thinking about the current scope of services, but what's the roadmap? You know, how do we, you know, move together? You know, not just thinking about today, but about tomorrow, day after tomorrow. Uh, you know, some of the, uh, you know, I'll share some examples like uh, some of the SaaS companies have this uh, title, customer success manager. And I've asked them to change their title to partner success manager, because when you say partner, you know, the ownership comes. Uh, the other thing which I have proposed in marketing is we are no longer uh, calling RFP as request for proposal, but we are going to call request for partnering or RFC request for collaborations, because it's not just about, I think you need to work together uh, for, you know, uh, defining the services. Sometimes we don't know what we don't know. Uh, and then finally, uh, you know, today everybody talks about uh, technology, you know, uh, really leveraging uh, technological solutions from suppliers. And being worked so long in technology, uh, I have seen sometimes we are so fascinated about technology that we first look for a solution and then try to find a problem. Uh, everybody talks about AI, but we also talk about NI. Let's not underestimate NI, which is natural intelligence. And uh, so what we do, and you know, now we are saying diversity and inclusivity. So we are extending that concept to technology also. Uh, we are very good in diversity of technologies, but we need to invest in the inclusivity of the technologies also. So spend time with uh, your suppliers, uh, not just understanding the solving a particular problem, but how this technology is going to work across whole, whole systems. So, so these are some of the uh, you know, levers which we have taken to create value through suppliers. Ashish, I really love how you guys have changed just the mindset change in general with kind of flipping the script a little bit. I think sometimes um, procurement and suppliers can come to the table a little bit guarded. And I actually, I saw a poll this morning on LinkedIn that was asking um, this, this one person's non-procurement network, when you meet a procurement professional, are you thrilled and excited? Are you neutral or are you guarded? And I, and for me, I can't imagine going into a table already thinking that you're going to get screwed at the end of the day, like already thinking that it's going to be a bad, a bad relationship. Um, because I think that just sets the tone poorly in, in, at the very beginning. So the fact that you are changing the word from supplier to partner, it already establishes that that's the kind of level of relationship that you want with 
your suppliers and partners. Um, so I, I love that you guys, you know, flipped that a little bit to, to just already just change the mindset of, and of everyone coming to the table. That's great. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, um, I'd like to uh, change and pivot a little bit so we could talk a little bit about how the COVID pandemic has affected each of you professionally. So Carla, I'd like to circle back around to you if I, if I may. Um, what was the impact that COVID-19 um, has had on your particular line of business? Yeah, definitely. Changing the work environment uh, where the culture is focused on employees' experience in the office and move towards a remote experience was a challenge first. Uh, the team had a, a, to adapt to this new reality on working from home and interactions done over web conferences. Uh, no more chef design meals, no more yoga or meditation rooms, no more gyms or coffee bars. So it, it was a challenge at, you know, in the beginning. Uh, from a technology perspective, uh, the company was aligned to work remotely, uh, so Dropbox was always prepared for that. Um, we had video conferences, we had chat, uh, collaboration tools, especially the Dropbox tool, uh, which is uh, very high on the uh, collaboration now for, for all companies that are desired to do the same model. So um, Dropbox took this, this, this um, initiative to actually say that we're going to be virtual first. So what that means is uh, we will all be working from home indefinitely. So uh, we, are, we are proving this case and we are testing waters. We are actually testing with our own tool and it has been a nice challenge. But what has changed for my team was that, uh, for example, the type of projects and prioritization that we had before. So if we were just following a normal year, um, it would be, um, you know, predictable and um, you, you could pretty much plan what we had to do. Uh, but then the whole prioritization and speed to deliver different projects started, right, with COVID. So all of a sudden we had to pivot to support the virtual first initiative. And uh, the main focus was to create the environment that supports employees to work from home. So. Uh, even though uh, we were working definitely from home, the company is still investing on spaces for team collabor collaboration. So that means that we will have an office in, in San Francisco, not for work, but for collaboration, for team building, for discussions and, and so forth. So that really required my team to really work and focus on different things, including, you know, you know um, uh, Susan is gonna, is gonna be happy on, the, on this one, including food service support, because we had to all of a sudden, you know, where we had everything on-prem, you know, uh, we are outsourcing some of those things because now it's a smaller scale and different offices um, around the U.S. and globally. So that um, uh, on-premise collaboration actually brought a lot of different projects to the table as well. So we ran an RFP uh, to find uh, services, providers for like remote help desk, uh, hardware support, and um, uh, across different countries, which was a huge project. Uh, it took us about three months to run a project that usually takes six months. You're talking about global, finding different uh, providers for different uh, um, areas um, of the globe. So we had to run all of this in huge speed, you know, so it was very challenging, but, you know, um, we, we are making those happen. And um, uh, I think that uh, right now, I mean, we are just um, meet, uh, we are running an RFP on conference and, and meeting spaces as well. So uh, it has been a challenge. It has been a lot of fun. And it made COVID, you know, really like a focus thing for us, we were completely on, on target for delivering those projects. <laughs> That's great to hear that, um, you know, when all of this first started and, and everyone was, you know, forced to be at home that you guys, not that you um, weren't focused on your, your customers, but that you went inside, you turned it around and focused on your employee engagement and what was going to be the best thing for them, I mean, for their mental health, <laughs> you know, aspect of, of having to be working from home for so long and, and how 
you guys have been able to transition to, hey, this is what we're going to do now because you know what? This works. I bet you your employees are, are probably 75% happier in, in the new work from home lifestyle that they have. And, and the fact that you guys have been able to achieve that um, and not just, uh, you know, say, oh, we're going to go back to work or no, you know, we're going home. Having, having that flexibility, you know, and really listening to what it was that they wanted um, is really great to hear because at the, I think at the end of the day, it's, it's your employees that really are, are your business. And if they're not happy and they're not engaged, you know, how are they going to make sure that your customers are engaged and, and, and are happy as well? That's great. Definitely. I think that the major point here is to make sure that the culture is carry on, especially now that we're going to be working from home. And it was an amazing culture that Dropbox had built. And uh, just to make that happen, you know, um, remotely is going to be, you know, the next challenge. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great job. <laughs> um, Alan, I would like to circle back around to you, if I may. Um, so the pandemic has forced a lot of businesses how change and how they operate. Um, so how can you... Uh, how can you tell me how um, what has changed within your procurement and how it operates and the resulting value? Um, I'm sure you know things have shifted um, in yeah. that respect with what you thought you know value creation was going to be in 2019 and what it ended up being in 2020 and 2021. So I'd love to hear hear what you have to say. Yeah, that's a good question. We have um, in North America here we have 22 essential operating facilities, um, and they remained operating throughout the pandemic. We did not, uh, the, our de the demands on our company were not um, meeting what was forecasted, obviously, as a result of the pandemic, but we remained fairly healthy in terms of demand for our products throughout the pandemic. And we were obviously scrambling uh, to create policies that needed to be supported by uh, new, new supplies, new services that, that we have never needed before. It, with all with the intention of making sure that our operations would continue to operate safely. And uh, within three weeks, we had uh, uh, stocked inventory of all disinfectants, masks, temperature screening equipment, anything you could imagine to meet CDC requirements, state requirements. We had it inventoried within our two major DCs here in the US, and we developed a uh, a fulfillment process so that 22 locations could request the materials. We stood all this up in three weeks. And it was, uh, I, I think I look, I look back at it as one of the busiest times in my life where I've, I've never worked so hard in my life, but it ended up being a different priority for me. I mean, I was essentially making sure that we were protecting our revenue and making sure that we had all of the services and supplies and things we needed to continue to operate. So to me, it was, it was a different um, a priority than what traditional procurement teams would be held responsible for on the indirect side. I mean, direct, you know, direct materials, you're obviously being measured on on-time performance and having, having what you need when you need it. Me being an indirect, this was a, a much different uh, change in everything that I had been involved with. And uh, it was, it was the, the top priority of the company to make sure we were protecting the revenue. And I felt as though that was a tremendous value that we provided um, on the indirect procurement side to make sure the operations had everything they needed to remain operational and safe. You know, and I bet your, you know, the staff at each of those 22 locations really felt that you guys were really were looking out for them. And, and their safety and their comfort level and, and all of that. So that's great that you guys were able to pivot like that and just focus on, on them. Yeah. And it would have been impractical to rely on the local locations to support themselves. It was just not, that was just not an approach that was going to work. So it needed to be centrally managed and led and uh, a lot of communications, a lot of meetings with site, all the site leaders every week and talking about you know, supply constraints as you all heard about for things like masks and all that good stuff. But uh, you know, largely it went, it went very well. That's, that's wonderful to hear that uh, you guys were able to just smooth that way because now they can come back to work and, and feel comfortable and, and get their job done that they have right. to do. So that, that's wonderful, that's wonderful. Um, Susan, so I'd like to, to pivot over to you if I may. Um, so 
what are some of the procurement challenges facing the food service industry in particular during COVID? I'm sure you've got a million stories to share. Uh, COVID definitely hit our industry extremely hard. I mean, some of the things that happened, I don't think any of us would ever, ever imagined would have happened. Um, you know, for us, you know, our, at the time, the company I was working for, we had seven restaurant brands and they were all fast casual. Um, well, two of the restaurant brands were based primarily in malls. You've got like Cinnabon, Annie Ann Pretzels, um, you know, so literally overnight, we closed almost 2000 stores. So, cause they don't have drive-throughs, you know, they can't do third-party delivery through the mall. So, um, you know, it was a shock, you know, I mean, those, my heart just broke for the franchisees and for the employees of those stores. Um, you know, it was, like I said, literally overnight, it, it completely, um, you know, knocked us down. So it, it was extremely challenging for sure. Um, the one brand that really, kind of stepped up and we think the thing that saved the help save them was Schlotsky's because about 95% of their stores have drive throughs where some of our other concepts like Moe's, McAllister's Deli, um, Jamba, you know, they don't have drive throughs for the most part, they're standalone stores. So, you know, they immediately stepped in and started, you know, coming up with third party deliveries. They started coming up with family meal kits, you know, like at Moe's, they I mean, literally within a few weeks, we came up with this um, box that basically you could order a, you know, a fajita for four, you know, a fajita kit for four. So, you know, we really had to kind of think outside of the box immediately to, again, bring the value. Um, but that also brought a lot of challenges to procurement because, you know, unfortunately, a lot of our manufacturers, you know, they were dealing with the same thing with COVID, like a lot of folks, you know, a lot of their employees, um, you know, they weren't come on producing at full capacity. So, we literally week by week, I mean, we were just hoping POs would get filled and, you know, we were hoping any, you know, are we going to get chicken this week? Are we going to get, you know, toilet paper this week? I mean, it was just, you know, literally for, for quite a few months, it was, it was extremely challenging. Um, you know, and then when COVID first hit, a lot of our distribution centers were sitting so heavy with inventory. So we had to write off a lot of that inventory that, you know, was in refrigerators or that was going to go bad. So, um, and then when, when things did start to pick up, all of a sudden we couldn't keep up because, you know, D DCs were placing POs because they were out. And then we started seeing an uptick, you know, with more of the, the third party delivery and people were getting more comfortable using it. So we started getting challenges on our end. You know, we got to place POs pieces sooner. And then the sub manufacturers were having our POs, you know, instead of a 10 day lead time, they wanted 21 days. So we, we really faced a lot of challenges um, across the whole food service industry. Um, and, you know, when it came to value, I hate to say, but we, it was hard. You know, we really had a lot of challenges trying to find any, we were just trying to keep our doors open, to be honest. And, you know, when you talk about gloves, our glove price literally tripled um, just because, you know, we couldn't get the, you know, one of the main issues was getting, um, the import, you know, getting product over, all the ports were closed, or if the ports were open, you know, there was 600 container, you know, 600 um, ships, you know, what waiting to land, and they were being held up, and, you know, for months, it's like, we're waiting, we're waiting, the product's sitting on the water, so, I, you know, like I said, unfortunately, we didn't see a lot of value during that time, if I'm being honest, um, but luckily, we are seeing things turn around, and things are definitely getting back to normal, most of the brands that I've worked with, um, are doing much better. We're seeing norm numbers kind of pre-COVID. So we're very excited about that. Still some labor challenges, but um, like I said, I wish I could talk about value, but it was, it was a tough time, but we did learn a lot. Um, I think you see a lot of your food service companies are now looking at different ways they do their, um, their brick and mortar. You know, a lot of them are getting away from a sit down restaurant and you're just seeing a drive through. You know, a lot of them are looking at, you know, double, triple drive through. So I think you're really going to see a lot of restaurant brands changing over the next, you know, it's going to be different going forward. I don't think it's going to, you know, go back to the way it was. Um, I think some, but you're definitely going to see a difference when it comes to some fast casual and QSR restaurants. You know, I think of, of any of the industries, I think that was probably most affected um, by COVID was the food industry. I mean, technology, I feel like 
there was that pivot where everyone was working from home. So there was this scramble to make sure the infrastructure was there um, for employees, but also for, you know, being able to collaborate with, with customers as well. Um, you know, Ashish with working with Clorox, I mean, I, can't, I should have bought stock in Clorox like, oh. like last October, <laughs> over a year ago. That would have been pretty awesome. But because I, I didn't only imagine the amount of growth that you guys saw as she said. Or when, and also and also Zoom. I mean, literally, because I've I've always worked in a corporate office for 20 years. We'd work from home maybe once a week, but we had a, a senior VP that didn't believe in working from home. He didn't think people would get their work done. So when this happened, we literally again in March, you know, we all went work from home and we're still working from home. So, uh, you know, it's funny about a, a month or two months into it, he actually made a comment on one of our meetings and he said, you know what, you guys actually do work. You're getting stuff done. <laughs> so I think a lot of companies went through that because, you know, we all, like you said, overnight, literally all went, at least the corporate office, you know, we went to working from home. So I wish I'd have buns, uh, you know, stock in Zoom because I think, you know, the amount of calls that they've started to have to manage is just off the charts. So. Absolutely, absolutely. And just, um, you know, you mentioned that you weren't sure of, of how much value you guys brought during that time. And, but how much strain you guys were under with supply chain and then with COVID practices. And then it seemed like every month, you know, individual local municipalities were changing what the COVID rules were by, by local and county and state levels too. So for you to have navigated through all of that, I mean. Well, and, and, also, and also many of our companies, like my company, we probably laid off and furloughed 30 to 40%. We took a 30% pay cut for about four months. Um, so it was, it was some challenging times. And, and again, I'm, I'm thankful I had a job. I, you know, was one of those fortunate to keep my job. Um, but it was, it was, like you said, not only on the business standpoint, but from a personal standpoint, you know, I think for a lot of us that had to navigate it, there was a lot. So, you know, 2020 will never be forgotten. <laughs> it won't. And, you know, the fact that your franchises too are already kind of shifting by saying, hey, you know what, let's let's not renew our lease maybe in this brick and mortar and, and do more of a drive-through situation instead or double drive-through. I know I know In and Out does like double and triple drive-throughs because they're they're always so busy. Um, but the fact that you're already doing that because on, in all honesty, I don't really feel like in, in at least my lifetime this is going to be the only pandemic that happens. I mean, we deal with the flu and all that stuff every single year. I don't think this is the last time, unfortunately, something like this might happen. Maybe hopefully next time we're a little bit more prepared. <laughs> for it well, I, yeah i think one brand that really had it kind of even before covid was here in the south of course we have chick-fil-a and so you know chick-fil-a they had those double drive-throughs down pat they have employees outside already taking your order so you know when their drive-throughs are 20 30 you know cars deep i mean they get them moving so you know i know they'd love to open their dining rooms at some point but but their sales are still off the charts so so they know they've got it down pat that's wonderful. And just in general, uh, the companies that were able to pivot like that and just kind of, as, as she mentioned before, like thinking outside the box, I think th those are the companies that are, you know, six months into 2021 are already seeing their numbers rebound as far as their revenue. Well, yeah. And what I really, what really hurts more is the entrepreneurs, the family owned, because they don't have the backing of the franchisee, the company, or they don't have the backing of a corporate office. So those are who I, I worry, you know, I do definitely worry, worry for because, you know, they don't have that backing. So that's, that's more, you know, coming from my industry, my heart kind of breaks for them because it's been extremely hard for those folks. I can imagine, I mean, just being a, um, a woman-owned small business myself, uh, you know, last year was pretty challenging. I had to pivot my, my, in my own ways um, with a couple of my, my larger customers. And one of them is actually in the health industry. And so they, they were locked down a lot. None of their clinics were open, kind of the same thing. I think people were kind of afraid to go in as well because they just didn't want the increased risk. Um, but at the same time, I kind of, I, I looked at it more as a, yeah, am I taking a, a little bit of a hit right now by maybe extending their terms? from net 30 to net 60 or net 90, that's just helping them with their cash flow. So if I can help them, even though I might be struggling a little bit, you know, financially in that way, I know in the long run, it's really gonna help them. And, and it's gonna show what kind of partner, you know, I wanna be with them that I'm not just saying, oh, well, it's COVID, everyone's, you know, in the same boat, I'm sorry, I can't help you. You know, everyone has to think 
a little bit outside of what the norm is to be able to maintain you know those relationships as well and those and those partners will remember that you know we we run into the same thing and that's what we're looking for when we look for supplier partners is you know, who's going to be with us through the ups and downs, you know, especially when so many of the commodities that have been off the charts and things that we've had to work through. I mean, we, we all have to take our hits and there's some ups and downs. And we have to ride that together. So, so they'll stick with you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so I'd like to round this uh, second round of questioning out with you, if I may. Um, so how did your procurement uh, team sail through the pandemic and, and achieve some results? Thanks, Heather. Uh, while pandemic posed many challenges, you know, we, we know, uh, but it also gave us an opportunity uh, to move from, I call it, what is procurement to this is procurement. I think during pandemic, um, procurement was at forefront and business needed us the most. Uh, let me give some examples of uh, what we engage in small but impactful team activities uh, to you know for people to stay focused and committed so we uh, to overcome the feeling of being stuck at home uh, we changed our virtual background uh, to the pictures of places we have visited in the past and it really helped you know in kickstart the meeting in a livelier manner and it really lightened up the mood while uh, everyone was sharing their experiences. People were curious to know more. Uh, today, my background, uh, what we were discussing, Heather, is uh, is a uh, you know picture of the largest painting of Netherlands, which I took back in 2014. And this activity made us virtually visited so many places, new places, which would not have been possible otherwise. And we call this activity as be limitless. You know? So uh, the second thing, uh, you know, I get some of my ideas in the post office. Uh, and one of my idea when I was standing uh, in a line there was, I realized that we as a procurement team needs to work like a postage stamp. What is the role of postage stamp? You know, a postage stamp is when you uh, paste it on the envelope, it sticks to it uh, till it reaches the destination, you know, irrespective of who is holding it, where it is kept, where it is traveled, you know, how long it has taken to be delivered. So we in procurement adopted this approach, uh, stay determined, stay committed, stick to the project, you know, throughout the whole process until it reaches to its destination. Uh, the third example, which I can take is, you know, we started a campaign, uh, everybody was talking about stress. So we uh, started a campaign, let's give stress to stress. Uh, so we had uh, theme-based meetings, uh, regular check-ins, uh, and check-ins is not just about your work, but about your well-being also. Uh, virtual coffee chats, uh, small celebrations, and very importantly, shifting our mind from here to here, uh, you know, from, from head to heart, uh, we supported and took care of each other. We knew that we are physically distanced, but digitally much, much closer. Uh, so our every day started with an expectation and it ended with an experience. And we learned from those everyday experiences, uh, continue to do the right things and were able to achieve uh, good and desired results. You know, I think one of the things that COVID um, has taught me, and I've seen this with, with other professionals and companies too, is um, it's humanized us a lot more. You know, your employees and, and, and staff that you work with are not just employees anymore. They're not just the person you see at the water cooler. Yeah. You know, you now, you know, are seeing the little kids running around in their background or their dog barking in the background or... or getting, you know, the doorbell ringing and getting a UPS delivery. It's all of those little things, you know, at first I think a lot of people were like, you know, making a lot of apologies, you know, for what real life was happening around them. But now it's, it's normal. We all deal with all of this same stuff every day and all those, those little things that stress us out. Um, so the fact that you guys were able to kind of focus on that and, and focus on the, you know, emotional and, and mental well-being, you know, like all of you have within your companies by supporting your, your staff in different ways um, really goes to show, you know, how far you guys have come 
you know, and pivoted um, through COVID and been able to come out you know, on the other side? Yeah, I mean, open office, uh, has become like open home is your open office. You know, the office has reached to your bedroom, your living room. Uh, I remember uh, a meeting where uh, a seven-year-old son came and he said, mom, have you signed this contract? So poor kids, you know, in addition to learning their usual subjects, uh, they were also learning about contracts. And so, uh, yeah, it was a, uh, it was very different. Uh, and, uh, you know, in the company, I always say the first thing you need to learn is to unlearn old things. So we stopped comparing from the like pre-pandemic world. We said, this is the reality. And then, you know, let's move on. So learn to unlearn and relearn new things. That's, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. And again, I think, I, as I mentioned before, I think the companies that were able to do this um, and really focus inward, you know, on themselves are the ones that are, are coming out ahead, you know, um, more long-term as well. You guys are more open to, and more open and, and more flexible to, changing, you know, in the environment and changes in, in the economy and, and everyone's health, you know, pandemic and, and epidemic worldwide. It's, um, you know, really, really awesome to see some of the changes you guys have all made to uh, make sure everyone is happy and, and safe and comfortable. Um, so I'd like to circle back around towards value and procurement and how your strategies have shifted where you think procurement is as a whole is heading. Um, we've got about 30 minutes left um, in, in the discussion, so we've got plenty of time. Um, so, Carla, my next question is going to go to you. Um, there seems to be a lot of regulation uh, around data, um, ongoing security challenges, um, and a high level of growth um, that is shaping the future of SaaS trends. Um, I believe Gartner actually put out a uh, a statement that had said that there was going to be a growth of like 140 billion by 2022, which is just insane. Um, so how, how does this affect the way you and your team source technology products? Uh, yes, uh, that's very important to um, discuss. Uh, SaaS is a software distribution model that offers a lot of agility, uh, cost effectiveness for companies. So the increase in demand for SaaS has imposed a challenge, a challenge on sourcing, uh, given the volume and extended time to review. So uh, it requires a whole lot of uh, vetting process, uh, includes um, you know, reviews that are made on different teams. Uh, in, in, in the past, you would have to just go to legal and then you would have your contract done. Nowadays, you have to go and circle back with security, data privacy, uh, go back to legal, and, and even sometimes uh, at, at my com company right now, you have one more step, which is be before you even begin, begin all of that, you have IT solution uh, that they need to vet, you know, if you, if you really need that um, uh, solution inside of the organization, right? So um, it's taking a, a longer timeline to actually get things done. Uh, and it's crucial to standardize, you know, some of those things, right? And I have seen, I have worked in, in previous, my previous, co previous company, we had uh, uh, established uh, a process uh, in place. Uh, and I have seen other, other places as well, where they are trying to standardize uh, security questionnaires. Uh, they are trying to include everything as a part of a workflow to actually go through the process as, as one flow instead of getting to different departments. So it is very important to actually get um, all of this done so that you can create some more ag um, agility on, on vetting those uh, SaaS uh, um, uh, in your company, right? So developing thresholds like we did in the past based on dollar spend, it's no longer applicable because zero dollar is already a risk, right? So, you know, if you include anything in your environment, you know, you have security issues. So the most important now is like looking at like data classification, for instance, that dictates, you know, how, how deep is gonna be your re review or how light is gonna be the review and so forth. So a lot of things are happening and increasing the, uh, even from a uh, employee and resource perspective, it's creating an environment where a sourcing uh, person needs to be really, um, um, uh, following the trends uh, on what is happening in all of those areas, right? Uh, security, data privacy, um, 
and and even like SaaS, what technology is gonna stay and stick around, um, and how long you're gonna actually do the term for for your renewal. So um, a lot of specialization going in this area, and there is a huge demand right now. I can see it's very vibrant. A lot of companies, you know, especially here in San Francisco Bay Area, looking for um, uh, people that have that kind of skill. Um, so from a COVID perspective, I think that um, also companies that or SaaS uh, that are able to integrate with others. For instance, I'll give an example of uh, Zoom, you know, integrating with Slack and integrating with uh, your back office and then creating that loop where you don't need to really go to one system and then, you know, you go to a different tile to actually access, access another system. You can jump from a meeting to, um, you know, a collaboration at Dropbox, you know, or, or you can jump to a, um, another application. So it, it, SaaS is, is actually bringing to companies uh, a lot more services, a lot more uh, technology that you were not able to have before. You know, you had to have your own infrastructure is what was less dynamic. So I think that that's the shift that is happening. And I'm amazing the volume and the, the so, <laughs> Uh, interesting enough, you know, we are in discussions internally about um, uh, how can we take a look at what we are going to accept as a, a good solution, you know, at our environment. So they're asking business to do to run an ROI every time that they want to include a new software. Uh, and that uh, also has a purpose of saying, hey, if it doesn't have a good ROI, uh, it's going to be a no answer. And you don't need to give you a no because now your ROI is negative. So it's, a, it's an automatic no because the demand is so amazing. And a lot of people are trying to bring more um, uh, technology to the, the environment. It, 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 it's becoming cheaper, but at the same time, it's, it's, uh, it's tricky to, to negotiate. Um, it, it's, um, it's being a new uh, horizon for us to actually explore, you know, how far companies are trying to go. And uh, you have all, all of those things where uh, they're trying to include premium support, which is like, okay, a SaaS already has in its price the support, and now you have another layer. So it's our role uh, in negotiating. Uh, this is becoming very important. Sorry, I think I probably had given a long, long answer to your question. <laughs> no, you didn't, because I, I feel like um, you did, you've done a great job at, at explaining, you know, all of the, the intricacies of your team. Um, I'm not a technology person. So for someone to break it down the way that you have, you know, I mean, to your questions has been great because it helps me be able to follow um, and probably other people too, I hope. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> the challenges that you guys have had and how you've pivoted and, re and recovered and, and some of the new things that you're seeing, you know, going into the future, um, it, it gives me, you know, at least me, um, I could say it gives me a lot more insight into, you know, what it is that you do every day and, and what you're facing and everything. So that was great. Thank you. Um, yeah. Alan, I would like to um, be able to, to focus back over to you, if I may. Um, is there one thing that you can share with us? that has changed your thinking around the value that procurement provides? Yeah, so over the last year, um, I, it was really eye-opening to me as a procurement person, and I've, I've been doing this for quite some time. Um, I mentioned earlier how I was helping the facility stay operational and, and uh, make sure they had what they needed to remain, remain operating. But at the root of it, I was also helping people stay safe. And to me, that was very fulfilling to be able to play a role and provide value to make sure people were staying safe. And to me, that was just eye-opening um, in terms of how, how many different ways procurement can provide value. And that was one, you know, one example that was very fulfilling to me. That really like gets me here, honestly, because, you know, one thing that I'm sure we can all attest to is that um, viruses don't care 
who you are, they will affect each and every, every one of you in some way. I mean, I'm sure we've all had, you know, friends or relatives or people that we know, neighbors, you know, who have been affected by it in some way. And it really shows me um, how much of a family LeGrand has and its employees that they're not just, you know, employee number, whatever. It's, you know, Joe down the street who's got three kids and, um, you know, has these other challenges because maybe his wife um, has some health concerns and, and he's worried about maybe bringing that home as well. So, uh, you know, really, really touching, honestly, Ellen, I really like that. Um, ah, so sad what, what, what the world has been going through, honestly. Um, Susan, I would like to, to push this back over to you if I can. Um, how has procurement changed over the past year and, and where do you think that it's heading? So for procurement on the food service side, um, you know, some of the changes we've seen um, that we've really had to, to adapt, um, you know, a lot of the products we were buying were actually single sourced. And, you know, a lot of those companies really struggled through COVID and, you know, they were struggling, which made us struggle. So, um, you know, it's something that we really are having to look at pretty much every item and, you know, Look at the value of that item. Look at the total spend of that item. Look at the, you know, where the annual volume is going. And, you know, is that an item that we need to dual source? You know, should we, you know, have multiple suppliers? You know, some of our bigger spend, of course, we're going to have, you know, of course, our state category because of all of our, with the Blooming brands, we have some phenomenal, you know, beef products, of course. But, you know, um, we just really noticed that we had some items that um, were a bit more challenging than others. So that was probably one area that really stood out. And then another area was when it came to logistics, you know, a lot of our distribution centers, a lot of your restaurant brands, everyone, you know, when you go into your restaurant, you know, you think of like the cheesecake factory, or you think of some of these restaurant brands that have like books, menus, you know, and they give you so many choices. And it's like, okay, we're not like four. We need to give people like five choices and that's it. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think that's one thing that our industry realized is that, you know, we've got to reduce the number of items on our menu. We have to, you know, pare down the menu. And so a lot of that comes, was getting pushed by logistics. Distribution companies are saying, you know, we're only going to give you 60 proprietary SKUs. One of my brands had over 300. So we literally, we were able to get that number down to about 180, but what that did was we had to move some of our items that were maybe contracted to something that was maybe a DC stock item. So, you know, like some of our brands, we found out we had like six different ranch dressings across the seven brands. It's like, do we really need six different ranch dressings? You know, could we all come up with one ranch dressing that everybody could agree on? <laughs> So it was just one of those things that, you know, we just learned um, and we're not, and we're still working on it. I mean, it's, it's definitely a work in progress. This, this does not happen overnight because, you know, we have our, our marketing folks that, you know, feel like, well, we got to please everybody and we want everybody to be happy. So let's have all of these things on our menu. And, and we just can't do that. You know, I think of brands like, well, in and out is a perfect example. You know, we don't have them on the East coast, but you know, when I have visited the West, I always go. And I mean, I love it. What is a single double triple and like two cup sizes and that's it. I mean, you know, once a cup, you know, one size of fries, I mean, those are your choices. And yet, you know, they have amazing sales, people out lines out the door. So they're doing something right. So I, I really feel that you're going to see a lot of your restaurant chains going forward are going to have their menus are going to be consolidated. I don't think you're going to have as many choices. Um, I think that uh, you're definitely going to see some change in, you know, maybe the way they do business. Like I said before, you know, perhaps you're not going to see as many sit down restaurants as you're going to see more drive throughs So I think from a food service standpoint, I think those are some of the changes that we're definitely going to experience going forward. Um, but like I said, for us, I think the biggest impact has been sometimes I felt in the past year that distribution was almost controlling our business. You know, they were the ones to say, we're not doing that or you can't have that or we need to you know, work together to come up with a better solution because, you know, you have too many SKUs that are, um, you know, not driving your sales. And, you know, so we've, we've had to do a lot of um, looking at the menus, looking at what consumers want, what consumers are willing to accept. Will they still come back to the restaurant if we don't carry this certain item? So a lot of work has to go. Like I said, it doesn't happen overnight, but 
all the brands I have had a chance um, to work with, it's at the forefront of almost every single one of them is looking at their SKU count, looking at the menu items, you know, where can they consolidate? So I think that's some of the biggest things you're going to see going forward is potentially reducing some, you know, items on a menu. And it's really interesting that you, well, you brought up a couple of chains that I, I love. <laughs> Cheesecake Factory is one. I know every time I go there, you know, I, I feel so bad for the waiter, the waitress that comes by because they're like, oh, are you, you know, are there any questions you have? And I'm like, no, I'm still reading this novel. And, and even with their cheesecakes, I mean, there's so many different ones. It's it, it's almost makes it as you know as a consumer and going there it makes it kind of hard to choose because there's almost too many choices. And and I don't know going into a restaurant, do I need Chinese food type things next to you know um, American burger type food and and then tacos and all of these? I don't need like every cuisine in one menu. Well, you know, one of the brands that I had a chance to spend 12 years with was Arby's. And of course, known for their roast beef. But, you know, when you ask people, you know, well, what do you get at Arby's? Well, the beef and cheddar or the roast beef, you know, but yet, you know, we were trying at that time to throw in all these other things. Well, let's do chicken. Let's do this. Let's do that. Let's do, you know, and it's like when you go there, you're going there because they're known for roast beef. So normally you're good now, you know, but they're thinking if you go with a, you know, with, you know, a group for lunch, you know, and so three of you are going to roll a roast beef, but that one person is going to order chicken, you know, or that one person who doesn't eat beef is going to want something, you know, same thing with, you know, for a lot of fast food or fast casual having a vegetarian option, you know, it's like, okay, but we're a roast beef store, you know, and I mean, when I worked for Honey Baked Ham, it's like a vegetarian, I'm like, who goes to Honey Baked Ham when you're a vegetarian, <laughs> but, but I get it, you're going with friends, and so they are trying to at least please, you know, that those people, but I do think you're going to see a lot of companies really keep their menus at, at a reduced number. So, well, and I got to think too that there's got to be maybe some percentage of waste if people aren't ordering, you know, those random items that they, they thought were a great idea to add to, to accommodate to everybody. That's, but that's a whole, whole nother topic. So, <laughs> yeah. it's called obsolete inventory <laughs> in the food service. So, Yes, um, a whole nother topic we could spend quite a bit of time on. So I, I might actually talk with you about that. <laughs> and, and next time you are anywhere near an in and out restaurant, if you haven't had your fries animal style, I know they do their I, burgers, but do the fries animal style there. Just as good. <laughs> I, have, I have tried them that way. I have heard the, the, the little tricks to, to do. So, uh, yes. <laughs> Wonderful, wonderful. Um, well, Ashish, I'd like to run this back out with you, if I may. Um, what did you do to influence your stakeholders um, that earned you really a seat at the table um, with, you know, the different de different departments? And how did you guys collaborate with everybody um, so that you got that seat and earned it? This is always a million dollar question. <laughs> so uh, I have learned in marketing procurement. Um, that if you work hard in chemistry, you will score good in math. I know I'm talking about two different subjects, uh, but this is what uh, marketing procurement known for, uh, which is its uniqueness. Uh, you know, when you talk about marketing, uh, it is creative, uh, it is fast paced, uh, it is real time. Uh, sometimes I joke like milestones are moving jokes, uh, moving stones. And sometimes I wonder why, you know, if that's the reason marketing has ING in the end, you know, because it's real time. Um, they are trying out new things. Uh, you know, we have more pilots than in some of the airlines today. Uh, second is you need to understand, uh, and we focused on, you know, stakeholder. Uh, and by the way, I don't call them stakeholders as like business partners. Uh, you know, their requirements, uh, their language, I remember in one of my past role, uh, one of my marketing director uh, told me, hey Ashish, in marketing, we try to give messaging in one line. And I said, in contracting, we need all lines. So how do, how do we align on the language? You know, the pace they are operating, um, and not all projects work on the same pace. Uh, some projects may be moving at a residential speed of 25, but some may require a freeway speed of 65 miles per hour. So, so how do you, you know, align to that pace? Uh, the third thing is when you talk about table, I think the table itself is expanding now. We have diversity, uh, we have inclusion, we have sustainability, we have you know new way of working. Uh, 
Uh, so some of the things where you know we focused uh, and able to influence our business partners, one is which I always say stick to the basics. You know, having a stepwise approach uh, and adaptability. Uh, so we didn't try to jump on the table. Uh, we took a stepwise approach, uh, and I have been watching you know videos of uh, some top athletes, the high jumpers. And I have noticed they take like some steps before they actually jump, like they take like nine, 10 steps. So we didn't try to jump immediately. Uh, it's a game of, you know, passion and patience. Um, uh, second comes adaptability, which everybody knows, but that's a challenging piece. And I don't know if you have realized, uh, like unconsciously, we have adapted ourselves uh, to work on social media platforms. Uh, if I like tea on Facebook, I would say I like tea. On Twitter, I will say I like hashtag tea. On YouTube, I will say, you know, I will post a video I'm drinking tea. So, so we followed, you know, the same approach and um, really adapted ourselves to stakeholders' way of working. Uh, few other things, uh, I know we are like close to time is, um, I don't assume anything in the, in the procurement. So we did uh, some, you know, procurement roadshows to create awareness. Uh, and, and educate you know, stakeholders about our process and the value which we can offer. In fact, in some of the marketing teams, uh, procurement training is included as part of the induction for new joinees. Uh, other thing is, you know, when we think about procurement process, especially wearing a business hat, I call procurement process as simplex process. Uh, so it looks simple from the top, but when you actually deep dive into it, uh, it becomes complex. Uh, procurement has so many touch points like sourcing, contracting, uh, data privacy, vendor risk assessment, uh, finance. Uh, and then, you know, again, the example which I was taking earlier about like postage. So what we did was like act, you know, procurement acting as a single interface towards a business. And then we created some systems and templates to collect all the information once from the business and carry that envelope you know, across uh, different touch points uh, to avoid any redundancies or inconsistencies. And now I'm even further extending that concept of packet tracking. Uh, packet tracking is, you know, now this packet is ready to be shipped. It is reached to this location, it is delivered. So we are using this concept to constantly update business about, you know, where we are in the project, uh, you know, about the progress. Uh, you know, we took a lot of initiatives on the on the contracting side, also creating right uh, kind of templates for different types of services, uh, empowering people. You know, for fast. Uh, you know, if you need to move on a freeway speed, uh, fast negotiations, and then uh, finally, uh, using technology uh, and some systems, we bring uh, market intelligence, uh, did spend analysis, uh, and then. Uh, really looking at, you know, build the opportunities pipeline and proactively, you know, present it to the, to the stakeholders. Uh, and as a result, I would say last year, we have been able to achieve and work on strategic and critical projects in record time and, and delivered amazing results. And the list goes on, you know, this is a marathon. <laughs> this is a marathon with few sprints. <laughs> Um, I, I just have enjoyed myself so much hearing all of you speak about procurement and value and what you have all experienced and your teams have experienced over the last 18 months and where you guys think procurement as a whole is going. It's just been really eye-opening for me to get a little bit more understanding into each of your industries and fields. Um, so really thank you all very much for, for allowing me to be uh, here at the table with you and uh, just want to also thank our awesome sponsors. We did have one quick question. We've got a few minutes left. Um, Alan, I know you already um, wrote out a response to, to Jay Kaplan's question and it kind of pertained more towards procurement and travel. Um, so I don't know if any of you have experience in, in travel procurement particularly, but part of his question was also about um, like what, what uh, you know, guidelines are your own companies um, offering, you know, as far as traveling and, uh, and with, you know, for work, um, you know, do you guys have anything in place yet? I know Alan gave a little bit of a reader's digest of what they're doing over there. Yeah, I don't know if everybody saw it. We, you know, our approach to travel safety has been to do less of it. 
Um, and that's, that's opening up now as, as things are getting better. But uh, along the way, we developed essential travel policies, approval processes to ensure that the travel was absolutely necessary and it was for the right reasons. Uh, I'm sure, you know, I'm not that close to it, but I'm sure at the, uh, at the end of last year, we probably reduced our travel budget substantially, which also will con continue to have bearing on the pace of travel here with our company throughout the year. I know that during the height of the pandemic, there was, you know, guidance that we were giving travelers to perhaps not use ride shares as an example, just simply because at that point in time, they may not have been demonstrating the uh, you know, the safety measures that we would hope our employees would, 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 would want to have during traveling. Um, other than that, I, you know, I think we're partnered with airlines that um, have, you know, we reviewed their, their approach to, to safety and we did our best to inform the travelers with, with as good information as we could provide to them to help in their decision process of who they're flying with and where they're staying. And, and that was our approach to communicate what we could that we were hearing from these partners in their approach to, to keeping their, their, uh, their travelers safe. So I don't know if that answers the question entirely or not, but. I think, I think it does. I think it kind of broke it out because um, obviously travel procurement is, is a category itself, but you know, with respect to what each of your companies are doing, you know, what what guidelines have been going in. And I know so many um, different, you know, in-person conferences have gone virtual and some are gonna even kind of keep that in the mix. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Even though everyone kind of misses being around people and just socializing in general, I think, you know, um, being more cautious, you know, with that respect, um, instead of instead of just traveling willy-nilly and, right. and being around, right. you know, thousands of people every day, um, especially like, Places that typically do conferences like Las Vegas, where they're you know giant convention halls and just people all over the place. I think in general would just help keep people safer. Awesome. So with that, I want to uh, give a big thank you again to all of our speakers today, Alan, Ashish, Susan, and Carla. You guys are doing some really cool and awesome things in procurement, and I appreciate you being open and being willing to share some of the initiatives you've worked on, some of the challenges you've had, and most importantly, how you're adding value at your company. So we are going to be sharing this recording uh, this week, so you'll find it on social media and in our library. If you weren't able to catch everything um, that the speaker shared, you'll be able to review. If you have colleagues or friends who weren't able to join today, but wanna consume the content, we'll be sending it out to the database that's registered for the event series. And again, sharing it on social. So make sure you do uh, look for that. Heather, wanna give a big thank you for moderating us today and keeping the conversation flowing. And our next P-Talk will be July 13th, 10 to 11.30 Pacific time, 1 to 2.30 Eastern time. So if you enjoyed the conversation today, encourage you to join us again next week. And with that, I wanna wish everyone a wonderful rest of their day and hope you'll be able to join us again soon. Thank you. Thank you everyone.